Hello, lovely subscribers. And good lord, there are over 3,000 of you. Actually, 3,125 as I record this. I'm honestly astonished that so many people are following along with my hobbyist side projects. I'm genuinely touched. As of recording, my channel passed 3,000 subscribers a little over a week ago, so I put out a poll asking you a question. Should I do an Ask Me Anything video to celebrate? More than half of the respondents said yes, so here we are. Since my videos are almost wall-to-wall -wall remasters, I don't usually feature in them myself. Uh, except my wedding videos, but the metrics unsurprisingly suggest that no bugger watches them. They're just for me and my wife. So anyway, that means this video is somewhat experimental, uh, because I wanted to show my appreciation for all of you by addressing you directly. So, let's get on with the questions. Colin Sly asked, how do you manage to post these without legal issues? I thought I'd run with this one first, because it does get asked on occasion. Believe it or not, YouTube handles that itself these days. When you upload a video to YouTube, it does a scan right up front to see if the video contains any copyrighted material, whether it's video, music, or whatever. Uh, obviously, pretty much everything I post is copyrighted because I'm remastering owned intellectual properties. However, just because something's copyright protected, that doesn't mean it gets immediately blocked or struck. IP owners can mark their content as allowed for use on YouTube, in which case you're allowed to post it. You're just not allowed to monetize it. So why would an IP owner do that? Uh, it's because they can monetize it. They can gather ad revenue, viewing metrics, or more usually both. I don't monetize the content on my channel. Uh, it wouldn't be right. That would mean I was profiting from the hard work of other people. So if you ever see any ads on my content, it's because the legal rights owners are gathering uh, ad revenue in exchange for allowing me to host my remastered content. And this actually leads us neatly into... Yeah, this one's another one that gets asked every now and then. Uh, can I have a torrent, direct link, Google Drive, direct download, etc? And I'm sorry, but that one's a no. Uh, as per the previous question, one of the reasons I release my content on YouTube is because it does real-time copyright checks and allows permission to use copyrighted content if the owners have so allowed. Sharing the videos out willy-nilly online would definitely be piracy. <laughs> People often state when asking this question that they'd rather see it you know, without YouTube's awful video compression. Um, honestly, if you watch the 1440p or 4K streams, YouTube uses the VP9 video codec. So even if you don't have a 4K device, it's worth manually running those streams because to the eye, the quality is at least up there with Netflix and Disney+. Plus. This is specifically why in the video descriptions to all my videos, I start with, please ensure you're watching the 4K video stream to see all improvements. If you're watching something on YouTube using the 4K or 1440p stream and the content still looks ugly and compressed, it's more than likely because an ugly compressed video was uploaded in the first place. In fact, it's a solid reason that you don't want my master files. They're all at least 40 gigabytes per video. I want YouTube to have the best quality it can when it does its own compression, so I barely compress my videos at all. And speaking of master files... This also pops up in comments every now and then, something along the lines of, it's not a remaster, it's just an upscale. Um, honestly, I'm hurt. I take the point that yes, I don't get my hands on the original film stock or digibeta material, but I don't just whack it through an AI upscaler and call it a day either. I do a lot of work on the source material, specifically to prepare it for upscale first. Uh, here's an example from Erie, Indiana. Before even touching the AI upscaler, I deinterlaced the DVD footage, slightly sharpened the image, corrected the contrast ratio and retouched the colour grading. Uh, this is why I cheekily call my releases AI remasters. Yes. The AI portion is just an upscale, but I'd like to think the prep work I do is akin to a professional remaster, even if I do have to work from commercially released source materials. So 
What are these remaster processes? Thank you to Cyrus D. Gaston and Mega Gacha Man over on Reddit for asking about my processes. I won't go into too much technical detail here or this video will never end, but basically it goes something like this. First you extract the video and audio from the source. If the source is a DVD, there's a good chance that the episodes will be split across multiple VOB files, so then you need to merge all of them into one long video and slice them all out into individual episodes. Next is the meat and potatoes of the remaster part of the process, writing Avisynth scripts. Uh, Avisynth is a frame server, meaning it can be used to manipulate frames in a video stream. It essentially functions as a coding language and often takes up the most of my time as I play around with trying to get the syntax right and to tweak the image quality in whatever ways work best for the source material in question. This is the script I wrote for that Eerie Indiana example, which I used to alter the dynamic range, tweak the brightness and contrast, remove interlacing and combing artifacts endemic to early digital video such as DVD, uh, apply a light image sharpening algorithm, crop out the black edges that used to be covered by old TV overscan zones, uh, scale it to a proper 4x3 aspect ratio, and finally prep the code to be multi-thread processed, which speeds up processing time. I then run avisynth commands through ffmpeg on the command prompt, which spits out a clean video on the other end. That's when we can finally do the AI upscale portion. I use Topaz Video AI for the upscale, which has its own massive set of models, parameters and settings I need to play around with to find the right balance. There are several other technical challenges I have to overcome, such as keeping the audio in sync throughout all these processes, and that's surprisingly difficult, but I won't cover them here. Uh, this section already makes for some pretty dry viewing. I wrote an article about my processes for another project uh, a few years ago, and I'll link it in the description below. My workflow has evolved a bit since I wrote it, but the technical basics are covered in more detail there. Sticking with technical questions, V48Runner over on Reddit asked how much processing power does it take to make a single episode? <laughs> Honestly, it's not so much a matter of processing grunt as a matter of time. You could, in theory, run every process I've described on a low-cost notebook computer or a MacBook Air. You just potentially have to leave it processing for a very, very long time before you got any usable results. I have a relatively beefy rig. Um, for those who asked, I'm running an overclocked 10 core 10th generation i9 processor, uh, an overclocked RTX 3090 graphics card, 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, and I do all my video processing on high end M.2 SSD scratch drives. So, the components in my kit are all a couple of years old at this point, but they were absolutely top of the range when I got them. And even for me, all of this takes a long time. Uh, taking Farscape as an example, with the settings I targeted, it usually took about four to five hours per episode uh, to do the upscale, the AI upscale process. So I'd usually kick a couple of them off uh, at night before I went to bed, and they'd just about be finished when I got up in the morning. And of course, before I even got to that point, I'd already done the prep work and the cleanup, as described before. So how much processing power does it take? Really, it's just as much as you can possibly throw at it and even then you're in for a long wait. Delta250A asked, what's next in your plans? Thank you for asking Delta. Uh, I like to keep ahead and keep experimenting while videos get released uh, on my channel on a daily basis, but I've already prepped and processed several TV shows, miniseries and TV movies that either never got an HD release or I think could do with the 4K treatment. Um, I'm obviously limited by what is allowed to be used on YouTube, uh, but I always test that first before I start remastering anything. I posted a video on the 17th of April showing a few projects I already had prepped, um, I'll put a link in the description, 
Um, that one covered Animal Farm, The Odyssey, Robocop Prime Directives, The Borrowers, and Total Recall 2070. Uh, all of those are already prepped and uploaded on YouTube. Uh, I just need to make sure I can find the time to watch them for quality assurance before they get released. At the moment I'm also working on Slings and Arrows, uh, that's a Canadian comedy from 2003. Dead Like Me, uh, it's an American comic drama, also from 2003. Maid Marian and Her Merry Men, uh, it's a BBC children's comedy show from 1989. And as mentioned, Erie, Indiana, uh, that one's an American comedy, uh, children's comedy from 1991. And speaking of quality assurance... Jaikaeus on Reddit, um, I'm sorry, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, mentioned the artifacts that seem to show up in darker scenes and asked what causes them and what makes them difficult to remove. I, I call them the blobbies, and sadly I, I have no idea why they crop up. They, they get introduced during the AI upscale process, and they've been driving me nuts for a long time now. Uh, every time I think I've got them figured out, <laughs> they're still there. I thought perhaps it was the film grain generator creating something like a moi interference pattern, uh, but nope, they were still there when I turned them off. Uh, and then I thought maybe it was because my hardware's overclocked, but no, ramping down my voltages uh, to stock levels just slowed everything down and didn't kill the blobbies, so they annoy the hell out of me, but for the moment I just have to live with them. As for what makes them difficult to remove, it's not so much about difficulty as it is about time. Um, I've got a job, a family and a life to maintain and I just can't spare the time to manually remove them in an editor. I, I really wish I could, but without a method to automate that process, I just can't devote the time to cleaning them up. But that actually leads us nicely into... Elf This over on Reddit asked, is this a hobby or do you work in this field and do these videos generate any YouTube revenue for you? Uh, to your first question, it's a little from column A and a little from column B. I'm a freelance digital designer and multimedia developer by trade, so this does fall into my wheelhouse. However, my work is primarily in web design and development with occasional forays into video work. Uh, and in terms of these remasters, it's, it's very much a hobby. <laughs> a weird, weird hobby. Uh, and no, it, it doesn't generate any revenue for me at all. Um, I know I partially covered this already, but I do think it's worth reiterating. I don't think it would be right to profit from the work of other people. Um, yes, I pour a lot of time and love into uh, producing these remasters, but no one asked me to. Um, I haven't been commissioned to do it. I'm just enjoying playing around with some experimental technologies, and I'm, I'm glad I can share some of the results with people to enjoy. Finally, Neil Landscape, and, and many others before, have asked if I could share contact details. I'm a little reluctant to do that, not because I don't trust any of you lovely subscribers, but because well, back when I was starting out as a web developer, I put my contact email address on my website, um, which is never a good idea. It got crawled by every spam bot on the entire internet, and eventually I had to abandon that email address entirely. Uh, however, I know a lot of people have technical questions and the like, and I do actively enjoy answering them. So uh, I'll tell you what, you can grab me on Reddit chat or on Discord. My Reddit handle is u slash odvs, and my Discord ID is odvs hash 7689. Um, I'll drop them both in the description below for reference. So, there we go. Um, when I started writing the script for this video, I had 3,125 subscribers, and now, a couple of hours later, I have 3,132. Uh, I'm sure by the time I edit and post this video, the number will have continued to grow. I, I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for keeping me motivated and showing me that there are people out there enjoying this content. Um, that's what makes it worthwhile to keep going. Um, until next time. <laughs>